sanda, sanda, ki sanda. Kada o sanda, sanda, ki sanda. Nista alokan, insada alokan, yauda alokan, skawat kuikiska. Kada o sanda, sanda, ki sanda. Kada o sanda. I'm Terry Boone, and welcome to a program where we're going to talk about, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a map of native homelands and talk about Abenaki history and culture and languages. And let me first introduce, we've been on before, John Moody from the Winter Center for Indigenous Studies, Indigenous Cultures. Indigenous traditions. Traditions. But close. In there somewhere. In John's been around, a lot of people in the Upper Valley know John. Uh, John's been around for a long time. And John, I'll let you introduce our guests, and okay. we'll we'll talk about books. And, and I know we're going to have some. Uh, I don't, I'm reluctant to say performance, but, and I'm not going to call it entertainment. But we're gonna, Jesse, we've talked about Jesse before songs, the program. Songs, songs, traditional songs from Abenaki. So John, talk about our guests, please. Well, I'd like to introduce at the at the end Joseph Ivy Joubert. Joubert, excuse me, you You know? You're doing the French thing, too. <laughs> he likes, I, I can't stop myself. I don't know why. Ely is an elder of the Odenak, uh, Abenaki, and uh, was born up at Odenak um, many years ago and has graced us with his presence today. We're honored, deeply honored for him to be here. He's a fluent speaker of the Abenaki language and has been teaching the Abenaki language and helping this young man, Jesse Bouchak, learn the Abenaki language as did Ely's mother, Cecile. And this is Jesse Bouchak um, from Northern New York. And uh, he's a singer and a uh, poet and a um, student of the Abenaki language, a Abenaki man himself. Welcome to both of you. Thank you both for coming here today. To Indeed, thank you and welcome. Us. And I want to uh, go to Ely first. And when John talks about Odenak, you fellows, that's like me saying Wilder or, or West Lebanon or something. I know where it is, but I think a, a number of people watching this program don't know where Odenak is. Could you speak to that and, and help us on, on a map? Odenak is uh, located on the St. Francis River in the province of Quebec, Canada. It's uh, mainly French-speaking, with elders who speak the native language of Abenaki. Uh, it's about an hour and a half east, uh, west of Montreal. So if you look up in your map, you're mm -hmm. at Montreal. You go west about an hour and a half. That's where the St. Francis River is. The major town there would be Sorel or Drummondville. I'll put you right in there. I think most people have heard of Drummondville, Quebec. In mm -hmm. fact, I think you see it on mud flaps on tires going right. up and down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's about due north of us, almost due north of us, about, um, about 180 miles, I think. 90 miles from the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. It's the famous town, St. Francis, that was identified by Yankee people as St. Francis in the old days. And uh, Northwest Passage, the famous book about. Rogers raid on that village is about the raid, the famous raid on that village, mm -hmm. which I think the Abenaki to this day feel was um, genocide, essentially, bluntly, bluntly stated. Um, but to Yankee people, it was uh, probably the most famous event, military event in Vermont and New Hampshire history. Part of the reason we're here today is to is to illuminate the relationship between the Abenaki and this ancient land and, and uh, take us farther down the road than, than the biases of things like Rogers Raid. And all. We have, I, and we, later in, the, in this program, we will show this, uh, the, the folks here at uh, CATV will, will incorporate this into the program so you can get a better look at this map. But I'm looking at a map that comes from the handbook map of Western Abenakis, and it's a key to tribal territories and I was asking a couple of questions about this before we went on and looking at this. And this, if, if I can make this out, this goes all the way out at least to the Mississippi mm -hmm. yeah. and all the way up through what we around here think of as not just northern New England, but the maritime provinces yeah. of Nova Atlantic Scotia. Canada. Canada. Yeah. Uh, and so when we talk about Western Abenaki, 
explain that, please, on a on a, a map that most people around here would be familiar with today. What what territory? Well, we're really talking about uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, parts of Northern Mass, parts of of uh, Western Maine, uh, and the comparable parts of Southern Quebec at the minimum. And Western Abenaki is a linguistic term that's one and the same as the term Abenaki or A B N A K I, and it refers to you know, the ancient homeland of Ely and Jesse's people. Mm -hmm. um, it's, my wife Donna often says, the Connecticut River doesn't divide two places, mm -hmm. it runs through the middle of our homeland. And, mm -hmm. uh, Lake Champlain, which in Abenaki language is pronounced. Bital Bagok. Bital Bagok, or the Lake Between, mm -hmm. is that appropriate mm -hmm. translation? is uh, on the western edge, mm -hmm. um, and there are uh, cousins of the Abenaki, commonly known as the Penobscot, uh, or on this map as the eastern Abenaki, uh, live over in central Maine on the Penobscot River. Close cousins. Ely, uh, I know when John told me that you were going to be coming down here and be available to come do this program with us, he, he talked about you've been teaching Abenaki languages for a long time, mm -hmm. and I mean, the question I want to say. And My mother taught, taught in one spot, and I taught in the other word, so we've made it geographically. <laughs> yes. And okay. why did you why did you do that? Did she was she not sure at how you were going to teach? No, she, to her? she was teaching in uh, Mississippi. Okay, which and I think of as coming over more to the east. Right. And I was Love teaching that. in Montpelier, at Montpelier, mm -hmm. both at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught at uh, Albany University as well. Mm -hmm. And I, a lot of people were interested then and then started from house to house and then from house to a group. And it seems like no matter where I go, they find out that they got the language. And, and this the teaching language. of the language was not just, uh, I'm guessing here, correct me, mm -hmm. not just to descendants of Abenakis. If, if I showed up and said, if I lived in Montpelier or wherever the class would, could I have, could I participate in my that? Mother, my mother, through her, the people who ran that course mm -hmm. could only be Abenaki. Me, I teach anybody. As long as you have a need and a want and a desire, I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. Now you just said Abenaki, and I've heard other people say Abenaki, and I say Abenaki. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about in that car coming mm -hmm. up, it's help me out here. Abenaki. Is it, is it a... Abenaki. Abenaki. And why do some people say Abenaki? It's, it's just okay. Just a dialect. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I know that John supplied me. Uh, with some words, and we'll get around to those and talk about some of the words and some of the place names. And you, you have this this beautiful book. Let's let's uh, where the great river rises. This book has been out, I think, a couple of years, hasn't it? How about five years since yeah. two thousand? I had heard about it before, but had not seen it. And we'll talk about place names and 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 what we call today. And one one good example is what you said a minute ago, the Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We'll do that in a few minutes. But but Jesse, uh, were you? And are you a student of Ely? Uh, and is this how you? I, I'm going to answer this. Okay. One. I'm sorry, but I'm going to answer this. Okay. And I'm going to do it like this. I was about ready to give up on the language because all my speakers had passed away, and I saw this happening, and I wasn't able to to communicate any longer except to myself. And he came up to me and started to talk to me. And I had difficulty in understanding him. And it took about three times. And then I knew what he was doing. And I, I corrected that. And I thanked the Creator for the day he walked into my life. Mm -hmm. This man is so talented. He teaches through music, he teaches through example, he teaches through anything you can imagine. You put it there, he's going to teach it. And that's what I wanted. And what's so good is I believe in teaching the kids. Start with them. But don't forget the mother and the father. They too have to learn. So make it a, a learning in unity. 
and we've accomplished that a great deal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's we we I think we're a damn good team. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. How long how long ago was this team formed? When did he come to you and speak? And and you had a hard time figuring out what he was asking. I've him always to do. I've always known him to be a student of my mother. Mm. See? He used to come to the reserve and stay with my mother. But then one time he comes up to my house. So that's when I got to know him a little bit. But I didn't, there was no comrade thing there. And then, how long have we been together now? About 2008-ish, 2009-ish, oh, yeah. we yeah. started to teach together. For five or six years? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's just been, it's been wonderful, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really We see the things, we see the changes. wonderful for the Abenaki families, uh, our family and so many others. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to have hope that mm -hmm. uh, we can carry, you know, mm -hmm. language can be carried on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great gift. We well, should listen to his children. Mm -hmm. He has two young children mm -hmm. uh, who are, he's been teaching the language, just using the language mm -hmm. in the home, which is the best place by far to teach, you know, to learn. Kids learn the languages so quickly. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't call run that. running around together, or even when we do language gatherings over at Jesse's place in New York. And they're just chattering in the language. They're just uh, back and forth. And, and it's funny, like we come up in a car just to come here. The whole conversation is, you wouldn't understand us. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the first thing that goes through my mind listening to that is thinking about immersion, but that's not immersion. This is the, the, your, your children doing this at home. If I showed up, as I said a minute ago, asking to go to one of either your classes, if I showed up at your house and said, can I stay with you for a month and start to learn, that would be an attempt at immersion, yes? Mm -hmm. sure. But with your children there, and you, and you speak it up all the time or most of the time? Or yeah, as much as possible. How, how sure. old are they? Uh, my son is five and my daughter is eight. Oh. And uh, as soon as she started to speak words in English, um, I started to speak backwards in Abenaki to her as well, and it, it really refreshed. It was great for me. Mm -hmm. I've learned more since I've had the kids, and it's it's coincided with my time with Eli. Mm -hmm. So I think the time with the kids since my daughter was born and the time that Eli and I have worked together, although I studied the language since uh, around 1990, uh, it was really in the last eight years that I truly was able to become immersed in a language within my own home and uh, in travels with Eli. Whenever we, we're on the road together, it's it's like a little uh, uh, mobile college <laughs> for me. A little, a little, um, learning on wheels, and then we get a place wherever we are, and we're going to teach, whether it's here, we work at Dartmouth uh, through John's help at the Winter Center, uh, or it's at my own uh, education center that my family runs in Saratoga Springs, New York, or um, in any of the other Abenac communities. We travel to Maine, we work with other Native people who speak similar dialects. We're always learning too. I'm always learning. I'm definitely a, a lifelong student. There's not a day that goes by that I don't try and learn a new word, and I've uh, applied that to my kids, and they seem to love it. And as long as they love it, I don't force it on them. I don't push them. If I had an opportunity to take other people into an immersive atmosphere, I think it would really help. Mm -hmm. But when we come to these, we always prepare. We don't want to overwhelm. We don't want to. We can't just speak Indian for people because they, they 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 will eventually glaze over. It takes about three minutes, <laughs> and then you lose them. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to stay um, fully in the English language, but then really try and direct people in a way that when they leave, hopefully they have some tools that they carry home with them. And like Elise said, they can use if their parents with their own kids. And sometimes though, it's the kids who also are teaching the parents, like with the use of song, which we've done a great deal of. The kids remember those melodies and they sing them in the house. And then the parents often will come back and say, hey, it's because my daughter kept singing it. Now I know the song about greeting or the song about giving thanks or whatever the song focuses on, days of the week, months of the year. We've done about 13 different, what we call it, teaching songs. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this before we started this program, that you're going to do at least one song sure. for us. And I'm going to give you a second to get ready for that, but I've got a question to. for Ely. Mm -hmm. And before we get into other words, is there an Abenaki word for mud season? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or could we make one up? It's uh, season of mud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. Matsugi Scott. So it's better. Matsugi Scott. I mean, it's a, 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 a bad, bad, bad time of year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 
Azusco is mud, which means it's dirty. Bad weather, though. They, they, you yeah. couldn't kiss got this weather. So weather, yeah. yeah. And you're asking for what? Well, I was thinking of mud season, and, and you were talking about driving here, and thinking that the day that we're recording this is a pretty C-Wan? unpleasant day outside. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, the beginning of mud season, the official beginning of mud season. You hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, we do hope. It's been a long time. It has been. So, that, that's interesting you brought this up, because there are words used in English, mm-hmm. right, that Abenakis would never have used in their language. And what we have to do is look at this again, like he did. He took the word mud and then tried to bring something in to give the, the idea of season. See? Now, we did this all the way in the car. Mm-hmm. Tell them about the... No, Kizzy Lomsen. No, about the experiment and about the... Oh, it's, it's yeah. Very, uh, different types of bugoal uh, gum. Mm-hmm. Uh, I say astahigan gongoi bag, literally. Astahigan is a spear, gongoi bag is a mint. So in talking to my kids about what kind of gum they might want, we have to come up with a way to say it. Astahigan gongoi bag, a la tipo which would be from the French pepper. Gongoi bag or uh, peppermint gum, what kind do you want? Mm-hmm. So sometimes you have to make up new yeah. words. That mm-hmm. reminds yeah. me of the process of, of sorting out the Abenaki way of saying dart, Dartmouth mm-hmm. or dart mouth. <laughs> so we did uh, Bagwansi's Odon. Mm-hmm. Odon, that mm-hmm. this way, yeah. The remarkable thing to me about the Abenaki language is, is it is, I mean, we've just had the 250th anniversary of Hartford and several surrounding towns. And as, as Donna says in the new Vermont movie, that is, you know, Vermont's a fairly new idea, you know, on, a, on the scale of the human scale. Abenaki people have been here since very ancient times. Um, archaeologists will say that's true for at least the last 12,000 years. There's evidence of people being here. Donna and, and many other Abenaki say they've been here since creation. There are two creations actually associated with this region. And this is the center of that place, that, that old homeland, that ancient place. And Ely carries, and, and uh, many, many other Abenaki people carry these traditions, often passed down orally until recent years, which are very, very ancient. And they inform the, the place names, the Connecticut River and many other place names here, Manuscutney and many others. And they enrich the understanding of this place. Um, vastly, because really, those of us who are not native, who are from Europe or Africa or Asia, you know, we're pretty much newcomers here. And uh, these folks in the language um, embody um, that, those ancient awarenesses and knowledges and, and understandings. And I think it's vitally important. For them to speak, and why am I speaking? Well, I, we're going to give Jesse a chance because we want to we hear should. some music, if we could, please. And then I know before we started, we also talked about, and you just touched on it, about Abenakis having been here since creation. And, and, sure. I, and I, as I understand, there is a creation story that we, mm-hmm. we can talk about. But Jesse, Jesse uh, uh, are you going to play something for us? Sure, sure. Yeah, I can share one of the songs. Uh, We have a whole bunch of songs, as I mentioned a moment ago, that we use to just teach different ideas. And sometimes, as Elise said, we have to come up with new words, um, and we come up with new words on the fly sometimes. And sometimes there's a a time for the community to percolate and think about what words we're going to use. And amazingly, I think throughout New England, throughout um, the land where Eastern Algonquian people had lived, including the Western Abenaki, the days of the week all became standardized. Um, but of course, there were no set, there was no seven days a week calendar pre-contact. We'd look at the cycles of the moon. Um, we'd look at the sun for the time of day, and we'd look at uh, the moon for the time of the moon or the month. And this is a song that has to teach a new concept, but one we're all aware of. There are now seven days in the calendar, and it uh, goes through those days. And, and I'll let you know the, the, the words can be hard, they can be long, they can be very hard to remember. So to write a melody, as Lee and I were talking about on the way here, makes it so much easier for you to wrap your mouth around a big word. Um, is a word, which means a pocket watch. 
Uh, one word, and it's very hard to get get that out. <laughs> it explains everything about it. Um, and so some of the words get long. We sing them; they get a little easier. But I'll just let you know. Starting with Saturday, you have kada o sanda. There's a combination of the Abenaki language kad, which is to want to do something, a, a desire to do it, and then the uh, the English loan word sanda from Sunday. Saturday wants to be Sunday, is the word for Saturday. Kada o sanda. Sunday itself is just sanda, which means it is Sunday. Uh, the day after would be Monday, which is a kis, uh, which is a kado sanda, sanda, kis sanda. Just, kis just means it's already been or it has been Sunday. So three days out of the week are centered around Sunday. We see that influence of religion within native peoples of New England. As I said, all peoples in New England had this shared calendar. We then leave the church behind and we move to the second work day, which is Tuesday, Nista Alokan. Literally, it means the second work. And then we go to Wednesday, Insida Alokan, the third work. And Thursday, Iauda Alokan, the fourth work. And then we return back to the religious Skawatakwikiskat, beautiful word, the longest, and, and it means, yeah. Skawatakui is a cross. Skawatakui. In fact, skawatakui is what we would cook fish over the fire on. A skawatakui hikan, literally like a stick that's mm -hmm. crossed, but it became to mean the cross itself. So Friday is the day of the cross. Skawatakui mm -hmm. ki So we see that influence. A little bit of tradition, but a whole lot of that new influence of religion within Native people. The village of Odenak called St. Francis would not exist except it were a mission village. Uh, that the Jesuits maintained for many of uh, the French's, uh, the French allies who were often Algonquin-speaking people. And this is a song that I think makes that a little easier. And I'll sing it first without the drum. Kado sanda, sanda ki sanda. Kado sanda, sanda ki sanda. Nista alokan. Insida alokan, yauda alokan, skawat the kwiki iska. Kada o sanda, sanda ki sanda. Kada o sanda, sanda ki sanda. Nista alokan, insida alokan, yauda alokan, skawat the kwiki iska. Two times through the seven days of the week. Talk about the instrument that I would call it a drum. But yeah, it's got a good story too because this this uh, uh, yeah this pakuligan Oluni elite uh, and I went to a gathering among friends of ours not far from here. Nate Piro, um, an Abenaki friend, had a gathering and the gathering was around drum making. And what we did is we prepared language and we taught the Abenaki language as we all were engaged in the activity of making drums. And I, I helped Elite. We made a drum together. I made this, this one for myself. And it is covered in the skin of an animal which has an Abenaki name. Caribou comes from the Abenaki word, which means the one who shovels. Because if we watch the caribou to get to their food under the snow, they often will use their hoof or their antler to dig down in to get to the lichens under the snow. So makonlibu means the shoveler. And this is the skin of a caribou, a mm -hmm. loan word. Many loan words for animals. Moose is an Abenaki word, which means to be strange. And to talk about why we learn the language, Eli has said that the secrets um, of our culture are unlocked within our language. Moose means strange. To be angry is muskwaldahla, which literally means your mind becomes strange. That's anger. So we see that the natural state is not anger. You know, obvious, but we see it in the linguistical aspect of learning Abenaki. We learn the root of moose, and we all say it today when we talk about a moose. Um, muskrat is another loan word. Also, moose, the emerger. When something comes forth, it is strange and new to us because a muskrat emerges from a bank. So, uh, this uh, drum was made, as I said, as a gathering. Caribou uh, skin wrapped around a frame of ma'ahlax, which is the tree that literally means the gathered tree, and that would be an ash uh, frame from the ash tree, ma'ahlax. And then a little bit of nulka, an Abenaki word which means soft, and that's deer, a little bit of deer skin here just to hold on to. 
and uh, pull tight when the skin is, uh, when the rawhide is very moist, and then when it dries, it gets really, really tight. Mm -hmm. This is a sound. A hand drum like this is, or hand drums of this kind are very common among Native people across North America. I've, I've seen them, maybe at Pow Wow yeah. in Hanover in the spring, which is normally around what we think around here is the first or sixth. Mother's Day Mother's weekend. weekend, early May, which this year is around May 9th or 10th, norm yeah. normally is right in there. Uh, and I've seen these drums, but I didn't know what they were called. Yeah, so we just call it a, a hand drum, uh, literally, as Elise said, the pak holy gun in the language, which means pak, you hit it, holy, it's hollowed out, and egon, which is a tool. Mm -hmm. So very literal, uh, the, the meaning. I have another instrument that I could share if we have time. Okay. Uh, to speak of meaning. We have quite a bit of time. And one of the things, I, while you're getting that, w before we finish here, and I know there are some websites that we can refer to that people, mm -hmm. and, and, and when we finish this program, we'll, we'll be sure that they are listed at the end of the program, so sure. people watching this will know about that. Yep. Uh, and when we had, you weren't here when we did a program like this two years ago, but we, as I said earlier, we did play some of your music. Right. Uh, and I, in fact, I, I sort of had to screen it. I had to check with John before we, we incorporated it into the program that we did, and, and uh, absent you being here, I think he gave me the green light and we did that. So. Yes, we just stole it from Jason. <laughs> steal it, I brought it. Someday the royalties, we just us. We some, someday the royalties will arrive. But really, yeah, the, I'm sure. the, the music and the books that you see that you Lee and I... you got to get a different agent. <laughs> yeah. They are so... Uh, the, most, the, 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 the most success they can have is to be as widely util, utilized by as many people as possible. Um, they're not made in any way to make, uh, to make a royalty or to make money. These books are to help preserve the Abenaki language. The songs are the same. And it's wonderful uh, to hear that they're being used. And, uh, and it's, it's, I'm just lucky. I'm, I'm always thankful that I had the time uh, about a decade with Elie's mother, Cecile mm -hmm. Lawanola, and that I have the time I have now with Elie and with other elders uh, who I've met who are speakers of Abenaki and the gifts that have been given to me. Um, of knowledge. Uh, my own father was very, very involved in preserving and is still involved mm -hmm. in preserving Abenaki traditions. He's a writer, uh, an author of uh, many books of traditional stories, and that was a great inspiration. And I feel really lucky to have born, been born into a family where these things were, were respected and sought after. I think so many Native uh, children are, are, are raised with no, unfortunately, no appreciation mm -hmm. of what they may be immersed within because it's right around them. Me being not on the reserve, off the reserve, as my father was, it looked to me to be something that I really needed to go after. Mm -hmm. And I think that gave it a great value. Um, I saw mm -hmm. the, I honored and respected mm -hmm. the value that it held. As I do in the, in the knowledge that Lee brings to this too, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's something I, I feel is very very gizomando, very important. I think before we ask you to play the flute and, and another song, I want to talk to Ely about this book uh, and the the English translation, as I understand, is the First Council Fire. Yes. Tell me about this book, if you would. Uh, what is it? When did you do this? Uh, about three years ago? Yeah, yeah. About three years ago. Uh, I think it was, your father had asked, did I know of any stories? Then you had come to me and asked me about that. So this, not that you haven't already done, because he's done a lot of work with another, uh, Dini is his name. And, uh, I said, yeah, I might have one, and I was thinking of this story there. Mm -hmm. But I, the thing that uh, your name, John, 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 brought up something, and he says, this was made because you had creation animals in there, much much bigger, much larger than normal. And the Indians found a way to not fight. It was time for peace and time for organization. And I, I says, wow, he picked that up. I didn't think he would. And so I'm glad that I didn't hide back from it. I'm glad I just put it all out there and I was on the impression, well, if they get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. 
And this book is, I told you today, I'm really surprised. It is, it's a hot ticket. All right. This is a hot ticket. Mm -hmm. And Jesse had, uh, it was originally going to be, well, that isn't fair. Jesse did all the designs that are printed in here. Yes. He did the designs. And he also has a, uh, a system where he can put the words. Yeah, like an index. Yeah, yeah a word index. index. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. at that. It just occurs to me as I look at yeah. that, the word index, that's very helpful for someone uh, yes, like me. Yes, it is. If there, once this program's over and you, you guys go to where you're going and I go home and I think that was wonderful, but I don't get the pronunciation. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's where pe people, unless you really apply yourself and try to learn the language, mm -hmm. right. you're not going, not going to get that pronunciation, mm -hmm. and, and that's going to be a challenge. The intention of many of these books, there's three or four here, but there's several others, and uh, two older dictionaries done by Abenaki uh, elders years ago that are just being reprinted now. Um, the intention is to use them as teaching tools mm -hmm. for young, young people. Abenaki people and, and even non-native people who are serious about the language. And it's crucial because, you know, we can lament perhaps the fact that the oral traditions are not maintained quite as strongly um, or honored, I would say, as strongly in schools and, and in our Western European dominated society. Um, because the oral traditions of the Abenaki are very uh, remarkable. Uh, Ely's book is remarkable in the antiquity to which it reaches back to. It reaches back earlier than any archaeologist would acknowledge there were people here. It reaches back to the glacial times mm -hmm. before the glacier left mm -hmm. uh, and went north. Mm -hmm. um, and this is vitally important. Because and it also explains how ceremonies were, were beginning to take place, how things became part of the Indian culture, tobacco, the corn, things like that. At the end of this program, we will show the covers of each of these books, so our viewers who are listening to this and, and will uh, have a better sense of that and talk about the website. If you remember the Rogers Raid that I spoke of, until um, oral traditions of the Abenaki were brought to bear to um, illuminate that, that story, um, the only account of it that Yankee people had was uh, Robert Rogers himself, and it turned out 90% of what he wrote about what happened at Odenak was not true. Hmm. Um, and so ancient oral traditions informing the past, recent oral traditions of the Abenaki can be extraordinarily useful to uh, illuminate all kinds of things, not only place names and where we live, but uh, his historical uh, stories and events. And, um, I have to believe that your reference to the uh, oral traditions, that, that surely in this day and age, there is an effort, and I know, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll go, go on with it. There surely are ongoing efforts to record the stories and, and make them available, not just to your children and grandchildren mm -hmm. and people of the Abenaki culture, but as you said, teaching tools for people uh, what's the term? Non-natives was the term right. you used. Mm -hmm. uh, and so is that, has that increased? Is that, are you comfortable with what's going on to, to make audio recordings of these stories and, and conversations? It, it, there's a lot more to be done. Um, it's, as I said, my father's been involved a great deal in that. We're working um, with friends of ours uh, in different communities as well. Uh, we run a small publishing house, and we've printed 14 books in what's called the Native New England Authors Series. Each of these are different voices of indigenous people throughout New England. Um, and these are, are, there are many, many other voices that need to be heard, and more from each of those voices. Um, but unfortunately, sure. not all the nations believe in this. Hmm. Uh, there are people in my family that, that, that don't... Don't do that. Don't do that. No, you're wrong, Ely. Don't do that. Hmm. No, I'm going to do that. And what's it, what's it, just for a moment, what, what, what's the objection? What, what is their reservation about uh, you knowing that? It's, they believe that it should remain among Indians. No one should want to learn that language except Indians at Odenak. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me. Mrs. Esquire has been talking many, many years at the same time Odenak was talking. Okay? 
We have other communities. Old Olinak has been talking many, many years, the same years as Odenak. And to me, to not share your knowledge is not being an elder. So you're talking bad. Think it over. Okay, thank uh -huh. you for that. Uh, any other to... questions, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> we would say he hit that one out of the park. <laughs> that went in the deep right field stand. Uh, Jesse, you got to uh, play the flute before we continue with our conversation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the the flute is Pequongan, and and to follow up on the drum, which is that hollow thing which is struck. Pequongan is literally that hollow thing which is blown through. Okay. So we see the language is quite literal often. It's hard to confuse what you're talking about. And uh, this uh, one book I have, Moose Boss and the Magic Flute, actually describes how the first flute is said to have come to be long ago. And it had some magic power in it, but it was a, abused by a young boy named Moose Boss, who was at the beginning of the story a mink. And as most stories have, they have a departure. They have some kind of problem that's encountered a, a a decision made by the character right or wrong, in this case you'll see in the book pretty wrong, as he uses the flute's magic to keep calling more and more female creatures to his side, always wanting one that's better and breaking the heart of the one he had, until eventually he's changed forever because of this foolish behavior, the trickster. He's turned into the very first Sagwasis, the very first weasel. Um, and that flute, though, they say, uh, its magic was returned to the trees where young men would still go and they would still try and find a little bit of that, uh, carving a flute and usually using flute um, in, a, in a role as a courting instrument. In fact, many native people call the flute the courting flute because we say it has a bit of magic that may call the heart of someone who we love to our side. So with that in mind, uh, I'd just like to make a song up uh, for okay. you today and give you a chance to hear some of the notes uh, that this can be played, but you know, there's just so much that can be done on it. Every time I hear that, I think of a bird just fluttering around. They say, that, and they say too, that uh, the first flute um, was inspired by a bird. And so we often, so we hear the bird in there. And uh, we give thanks. We say, Kitsiuliuni Uzi Sipsa, mm -hmm. thanks to the bird people for the flute. Talk about the flute itself, if you would, for a minute. That specific flute, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a beautiful and I'm, as you, when you picked it up to start playing, t t just describe it, please. Uh, the end of this has carved into it the head of a coyote. And uh, often among uh, native people, coyote is one of those tricksters who I talked about. And we know about the origins of the flute. Here in the Northeast, the trickster would often be Osbon, because we have many, many raccoons. Osbon means raccoon. Um, so we could consider this, uh, this the universal trickster at mm -hmm. the end of the flute. And then it's made out of almost um, one of the favorite woods, it's not the only wood, is Molondox, which means that one of great depth. Molongin means it is deep. Molondox is our red cedar tree. And this is, in fact, red cedar. It has a beautiful smell, and it has a beautiful resonant tone. It's a block end whistle by design it, with an internal reed. So the chamber here is divided from the second chamber, and the air is forced out through the hole, just like a uh, 
uh, a whistle. It's the same technology without the ball in the middle that you see a, a raft use in, in sports. It was developed by native people, most common style here in the Northeast. We'll see external ripples or fipples where the uh, reed sits on top mm -hmm. in native flutes, uh, more from the Midwest. And please, uh, did you did you make this yourself? You got this from, I thought maybe you were going to say the Chief Nathan Perro workshop or something. You I, did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I, I do make flutes, and so my father makes I flutes. thought you did. I yeah. sort of remembered that you... This is a Lenape-style flute. Um, and Lenape is a great opportunity. The Lenape people are uh, a, a bit s south of us in the New York City, Pennsylvania area. Uh, the Lenape, that name Lenape, would become El Nanba. It's the same word, it's just a dialect. In Abenaki, we'd say El Nanba, it just means human being. Mm -hmm. Lenape becomes El Nabe among the Penobscot, it becomes El Nab among the Passamaquoddy, it becomes El Nu among the Micmac, and it becomes Inu among the Eskimo or Inuit people. So we see that one word. Um, and the style of food would be particular to the Lenape, and that's, that's where this was made. And I have some beautiful flutes that I've purchased, and this is one that I purchased. And you just tick those off, and, and, and Ely referred to this a while ago when I asked him why some of his family or others would incur discourage him from teaching the language, but you just ticked off several other tribes, if you will, and I, I'm guessing that you can speak some of those languages, that you, and am I guessing too far, am I being? No, the dialect shift between one language to the next, it's pretty easy to go from, uh, if we were looking at a hand and I were to go from Abenaki to Penobscot, it would be pretty easy. But if I were to jump over even one finger and go to the Maliseet, it would be hard without someone to help. Unless maybe I spent, like Ely and I had to do when we first spent a little time together. Mm -hmm. And then in, a, in time, we would get to know the, the tendencies. Mm -hmm. um, for example, contraction is really common among the Maliseet. So everything where I may say, skit kamigwa, they may just say skitch. Mm -hmm. So you hear the center of that word. And you just have to recognize where I'd say whale is pudaba. They may say pudap. And then there's also accent where I'd say kagui um, liwitamen. What is it called? They may say keg liwitamen. Keg liwitamen. What is it called? Just very different accent. Skeech is awfully, skeech is awfully close to screech. And I'm thinking about <laughs> Newfoundland and the screech. <laughs> Are you familiar with no, Screech is a rum drink? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that. When, when people start telling Newfie jokes, as they say. Well, they... speaking of, of something like that, Molson or, is a wolf, and we have Molson golden beer, right. which right. in fact is right. the wolf in Abenaki, Molson. Huh. It's not an N, though. It's an M in our dialect. Yeah. But it, I, I can understand a lot of, like John, uh, Paul, Mm -hmm. What's his last name? Yeah, Maliseet and Passamaquoddy, yeah. Roger Paul. Roger Paul, uh, Dana, Carol, Dana. Mm -hmm. When they speak, I can understand them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess, guessing, but 95% of the time I got it. Mm. It's just the intonations I'm hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all. Well, an Abenaki man I knew came back from Wisconsin and said, uh, hey, we were going through a village and... Uh, you know, the Chippewa Chippewa village, or Anishinaabeg is the people, some of the people there call themselves, and the name of the village was Odima. Odima. Odinak. Mm -hmm. It's the same word, almost almost recognizably the same word in, in that Algonquin language that is a long way away, um, but closely related in, in some ways, and in form mm -hmm. as well, not only in words. And we see the word Lenny Lenape is Anishinaabe. It's the same word. It means human being. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of other of the books in a minute, but John, since you, you got back in here, uh, people who know you know about the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions, but sure. some people watching this for the first time may not know. Could you speak to that for a minute, please? Sure. Uh, well, Winter Center is a, is a little nonprofit, native run nonprofit here in the Upper Valley based in. Norwich and Hanover and, and the wider region. And our basic job is to help Native people and families and communities to find their way in whatever way that is, um, and also to help educate non-Native people and everyone around us to the fact that this is not just Vermont and New Hampshire 
250 years old, <laughs> um, but this is an ancient homeland, and that every town and village, every watershed in this region not only had Native people living in it and and in, and um, revering and, and centering their lives here, but has had ever since um, first settlement. Uh, one of the great gifts of the work with the Abenaki oral traditions and, and non-native oral traditions or written traditions that were uh, sort of hidden away here is we found that here in White River Junction that the myth was when Rogers came back down the river in 1759 there was no one here. That was the consensus until about five or six years ago. Now we found some non-native and native accounts of there being a major village right here in White River which for the first 10 years of White River's or Hartford's founding from 1761 to 1771 um, was a canoeing village, essentially provided transportation to the nearest uh, grist mill, which was downriver in, at Fort Number 4 in Charleston. And this is of vital importance for all of us because we're in the midst of figuring out what people want to do with White River Junction in the next round. And, and um, I think we need to understand that this is a very um, ancient and and very widely inhabited place. In fact, when they were changing things around at the sewage treatment plant just south of us here, they discovered a major site which was quite ancient, mm. um, thousands of years old. And uh, I think there's a lot more of that here um, that we need to take account of. So it's important, it's importance but particularly want to honor the Abenaki of White River and the Hartford Historical Society that was that was founded in part by an Abenaki man, uh, Fred Bradley, and, and uh, so many others. And uh, so it's a vital understanding, I think, a part of our history. We have a few minutes left, and, and if I've missed something that you want to slip inject, please do before we finish it. I'll, I'll tell you when we only have a couple of minutes left, but. Uh, before we off camera, before we started this, I alluded to my first encounter, uh, or awareness, if you will, my awareness of native peoples. We'd read certain things, and most of it non-natives, no matter where we're from, had read something or had been, seen portrayals in movies or TV mm -hmm. shows, or, or not necessarily accurate portrayals, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, I man. And, and I went on a, a, a salmon fishing trip up in New Brunswick, up to the Miramichi River, and didn't know anything about what they knew a lot about up there is what I think we refer to as the Salmon Wars. People think about that out in the Northwest and in Washington, Oregon, and so on, but, but in the Maritimes, and I remember hearing about, I, correct me here, was it the Eel Ground Band, the Red Bank Tribe of the Eel Ground Band, are you familiar with that at all? Mm -hmm. in, in, in Migamah. They're Micmac, whether well, Micmac, yes. eventually called Micmac, but they call themselves Micmac. And, 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 and in Maine, the they, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO, they refer to them tied in, and, and, and one of the DFO officers got invited to go swimming without, uh, <laughs> he got tossed in over some confrontation. And I think about that, and I, I, have we come, and that was not that long ago, that was 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Is there more understanding? Are you and I want to direct this first to Ely of, of your teaching of the languages and, and observance of what's going on in the non-native culture, mm -hmm. and especially the electronic media and everything else. Are you encouraged by progress and and getting your stories out and having a, a respect and appreciation from non-natives uh, in your lifetime? Do you think that has gotten better? Is it the same? Are you discouraged? I'm going to answer that one. I think. I'm respected and honored by what I do and give and share. And if everybody gave and shared with everyone, we'd have one hell of a good life, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. Jesse, uh, you, you, as you, uh, as you encountered, uh, you, apparently you, the story was told a minute ago, you, you studied with Ely's mother originally, and then started working with Ely. Uh, do you share that answer? Uh, do you have a, uh, as I would say, a different spin on that, or, or uh, what is your comment on that? 
A couple things. I'd like to bring the drum back in, but I'd also like to say that the technology aspect, I'm very encouraged by. It. We've published, we've self-published these books. Mm -hmm. uh, we can we can do things like that that were very hard to do before. Uh, we also use things like uh, apps on iPhones and iPads and to, to make dictionaries accessible. We'll have a WesternAbenaki.com website. Um, Eli has a website. These I'm startled by apps on, on, on iPhones. I just, it, I'm not, that wouldn't have occurred to it me. It is just he has a great the entire Abenaki right. dictionary that he's using, that he's building actually on his phone. Mm -hmm. I carry on it with me. Person. And it has, it, it's a great access um, point hub right there with us. So mm -hmm. uh, we have, a, and I think that idea of native people grabbing on and using new technology happened the minute they saw new technology. But I think guys like and Ely and me of our age, we would not necessarily gravitate to that. That would you'd be, be surprised. I can't you'd be surprised <laughs> with Ely. He's right up there. For myself. Um, but, Hi, iPad, I got everything. <laughs> we, uh, we see at Odenac, we see a, 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 a man who traveled to college here in, Dart in Dartmouth, mm -hmm. uh, P Peter Paul was Okalain, seeking mm -hmm. out higher education, returning to his community and creating a printing press at mm -hmm. Odenac mm -hmm. and publishing in 1830 mm -hmm. three books within his language. Mm -hmm. That's cutting edge technology. 200 years ago. And, that, that, and the college had been around then at that and point. And here's a copy. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And From I think, 1830. 1830. And I think that tradition. Wikigan. Kim Zuiya Wikigan. Yeah. Uh, teaching book. Um, that, that tradition in, in to step back pre-contact and to just look at the drum, an elder Harold Tantaquidgen, who is a Mohegan friend of my father, um, Eli mentioned sharing, and there's a circle of knowledge that all oral traditions are a part of. Before we had books, uh, we Kiganal, the, the, the book, we had a circle, and that circle still exists. Without books, we'd have to use it and maybe we should use it more. And it says that there are four things, like the four directions, and as long as we do those well, no, no knowledge will ever be lost. And the first thing we have to do to come into that circle is open our ears and listen, kita. Listen to stories, listen to songs, listen to the birds, the flutes, um, listen, and knowledge comes. You may need to hear something many times, like a story, to remember it. The second thing is we need to open our eyes and observe. We need to see how the cycles of the seasons are. Uh, we need to see how a basket is made. Maybe we grew up in a home where people made canoes. Uh, uh, we would learn through observation. We'd have to see many times before we'd come to that third step again, which is to remember what we've heard and what we've seen. We remember it, we put it in our minds, and then we carry it with us, and we also carry a great burden or responsibility to make it into a circle and not just a straight line. A fourth simple step, which Elise said, sat sabana which is literally to share, to take what we have heard and what we have seen and what we have remembered as best as we can, and none of us are perfect. Um, but if we all do this, then that circle just gets bigger. It's the beauty of the circle is more people come in and it just grows. And then that knowledge, that pool in the middle gets larger and stronger. And so in that way, the story like Elise, uh, Natami Poro Azwi Squida, uh, was passed down, being heard, being seen, uh, told, being remembered and shared until finally it was written for the first time and, and so many other things in, inside that, that circle uh, of which the drum can be used to represent and the circle is such a powerful shape with, for native people. Mm. So I thought I'd share that. And thank Harold Tantaquidgen who had shared it with my father, um, an old Mohegan um, saying of where all that knowledge comes from. I knew him and his sister very well. Yes, Gladys. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. I knew Gladys. I never met Harold. And I don't know how I got. Oh, I was stationed at uh, New London, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and they were just up the road from us. Yeah, the Mohegan yeah. are in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're going we're to end here in a couple of minutes, and I'd like to ask you if if, if we can have something else, either on the flute or mm -hmm. on the drum, when we finish. But but I have to ask, John and I talked about this, and and coming here to CATV to do this program, you fellows didn't just come here to do this program. You're in you're in the area for some other reason, and mm -hmm. by the time people see this, that may have passed. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? There's a language gathering tomorrow, mm -hmm. Abenaki language gathering, and um, a few family members are coming together um, to work with Ely and Jesse to, to learn the language. Ely, you're laughing. <laughs> I'm laughing because you, excuse me. Why am I here? Because my agent sent me. <laughs> I did. Good reason goes. I'm sorry, guys. I have to get it out. <laughs>
<laughs> on Friday at White River Junction, right? That's right. Show That's up. Right. It's <laughs> on tour. The season the begins. The bus arrives, and <laughs> off we go. At the Where end, when we finish here, uh, uh, I'm Terry Boone. Thank you for, for, for staying with us, and, and uh, I will talk about our guest in a minute. And at the end, we will show, uh, when this is all over, uh, the covers of these books and also list some websites for people who've watched this and just curious about things that you've mm -hmm. talked about. So uh, uh, John Moody's around most of the time. People can track him down uh, sure. through the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions, and, yeah. and we'll talk about the website. Uh, Jesse Bruchak, thank you for coming here today. Uh, You're welcome. And, and thank you for letting us use your music two years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and, and Joseph Ely Jubert, right. thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. And, and hope that you will come back again. Pleasure is And good right. luck this weekend with the, the language Thank program. You. So, Jesse, you're going to uh, play something else for us to take us out of here? Sure. Please. Flute or drum? Yeah. Your choice. I'll do another song in the language. This is what non natives refer to as improv. So, uh. So, uh, now I would like to share another song with you. Kizila. Um, I'll try to teach you how to count in Indian. Okay. Good, good one for a song. Uh, we say Pazuk, Nis, Nas, Yao. Very good because we heard it in the, in the last song, right? Mm -hmm. For the days of the week. Mm -hmm. But now we'll just go right to 10. The song will help. Pazuk nis nasia we hai hai we ha ho stop we hai hai we ha ho literally means we hai hai we ha ho as most music has it's a vocal untranslatable the first four are easy from then on it gets a little harder starting with five no long nig we don't stone va wons in son zik we hai hai we ha ho no le we, da la we, ha ha ya we ha ho, pa zuk, nis, na si ya ho, we ha ha ya we ha ho, no long ni gwe don, strong ba wons and son zek, we ha ha ya we ha ho, no le we, da la we, ha ha ya we ha ho, pa zuk, nis, na si ya ho, Yow no long, nigga don't stumble once and so's it no leave. 